Let's take our Bibles, if you would please, and go to Psalm chapter 18. Psalm 18, we're just going to read the first couple of verses. Psalm chapter 18, verse 1 and 2. I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. I'm going to bring a message this evening on the Lord is my rock. And that's, for the child of God, that is the absolute statement of a nutshell of a Christian, the Lord is my rock. And uh, let's ask for the Lord's blessings upon the message. Lord, please take this time, God, uh, we've gathered together, Lord, uh, for as many that are here uh, we've gathered together to hear something from you, Lord, from, hear from hearing from heaven. We ask now that you clear our thoughts and our minds, help us to understand everything and help us to uh, apply those things to our lives and encourage our hearts uh, this evening through the word of God. We ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, I want to take a look at the phrase, the Lord is my rock. Uh, and of course, we've been through these scriptures before, uh, and just such, I, I just love uh, verses one and two. I mean, uh, if ever there was a story of everything that God truly is to us, it's found in these two verses of scripture in Psalm 18. I mean, everything, it starts right off with so many things, uh, and, uh, and, and, and how he loves the Lord, and how the Lord is the strength, and the rock, and the fortress, and deliverer, strength again, in whom will I trust, my buckler, my horn of salvation, my high tower. He is everything. He is our everything. You know, David praised the Lord for his faithfulness, and he began with that phrase, if the, the Lord... You know, if the Lord is not our rock, then our standing remains in jeopardy. That's just how it goes. Now, this statement is the foundation for everything and for every other thing that we, uh, that we have looked at previously. But if the, if the foundation moves, then every other promise is subject to move also. This is a big reason why I push the fact that God does not change. He stays the same. He doesn't move like that because everything built upon that would also have to move. And if you've ever played Jenga, you're going to find out those blocks are going down when they move. You have to try to take away from the structure and put it back up a higher and higher and higher until Someone just moves just a little bit too much, and then down goes the whole thing. If you've never played that, you're missing out. I'm telling you, that's fun stuff. Very fun. Great big family fun there, too. But listen, if the rock moves, the walls crack, and the house comes down. You think about what the dangers of earthquakes and what they do. You, you have, a, you have a, something like our church building, and it's on this big giant slab of cement, and it's there, it's got a foundation. But if that foundation starts moving, everything that's on that foundation will move too. And with that mo motion, we all know when a house is settling, 
stuff starts cracking. You start seeing cracks in the ceiling. You start seeing bricks move where they shouldn't be. And, and things open up. We've got a lot of problems, as a matter of fact, and you can pray about that. We've got a lot of issues with our whole front wall uh, out here along that where there is literally separation happening in the actual center block along our whole front wall. Now, we're going to have to try to dig all this stuff out and remortar everything, and hope, hopefully it'll stay, but there's going to be a lot of things that we're going to have to do I don't know if we can even get it all done before winter, but we're going to have to try to get what we can do to stop the leaking because the cracks get big enough to where water can get in and run down. So if you've seen some of those stained tiles, that's part of the problem. And uh, and Brother, Brother Boyce and I were up on the roof uh, not long ago, and he was showing me everything because I was trying to get a a feel for what we needed to do. So that, that's those are some projects that are coming uh, our way. But listen, when you have movement, when you have that swelling, whether it's expanding and contraction of something, you've got something that moves, it will affect every single other working piece that holds with it. Everything together is going to move when other people when other things are moving. So the the idea is to keep it sound. And, and sturdy and steady and, and firm uh, and, and settled. We need that. And when we have things that, that, that happen like that, then we see a pulling apart and we see that separating and bad things happen when we start seeing separation happening. So we don't want to have that. And we certainly don't want our faith to be on anything that's going to move. Your faith is supposed to be the mover of other objects, not the other objects moving your faith. That's exactly what the Bible teaches us. Our faith should be able to move mountains, not the mountains move our faith. I got this mountain, and now my faith is no longer able to go forward to this mountain. It's been moved. Right? I don't know how many times I've gone to try to go to a business that was there for, for forever, and all of a sudden I find out where they've moved. And I didn't even know about it until you see the sign on the door and the, uh, and the sign out in the yard for lease. And it's not great. That's not a great thing. And that's why the church must remain sound. We together have to keep it together. When we don't keep it together, everything starts separating and coming apart. And that's just what, and it can be the most trivial thing ever in, in, in most people's eyes that can do the most damage. And I, you even know that I even spoke out this morning about praying for those that were baptized and, and praying for for just the, the just because Satan wants to move and Satan wants to get in there and he wants to tear some stuff up he wants to discourage people he wants to make it miserable he doesn't want the church standing on anything he wants us leveled flat and he's trying to shake the ground and he's trying to shake uh, to see what happens because he's all about that. Look at Job. He was trying just different things. He was just trying a, an assortment, a bouquet, to find out what was going to make Job crack. Oh, well, if you touch his body, then, you, and he kept on. Take his things, take his family, take this, take that, take this, do this, do that. Oh, well, okay, well, you can do that, but you can't touch him. Go ahead and mess with the rest of it. Oh, well, that's what that's what the whole problem is. You've got this hedge around everything around him. You, you take that down and yeah, we're good. He's constantly looking for every single angle to get in to destroy Christians. And do you think he wants this place standing? Do you think he wants anybody left preaching the word of God? He doesn't. He doesn't. And it's amazing of what I've seen in my, in my lifetime of how he's even used Christian people to do it. 
He's used Christian people to split the church, to Christian people to destroy works. I've literally seen churches crumble and just, they're not even around anymore. All because of something that happened, some imbecilic thing that happened or petty thing that happened. You know, and my dad, I've heard a lot of stories that he used to tell uh, about churches splitting over the wrong pe people getting the first bite of the wedding cake. Legitimately happened. He ch a church split over a rubber stamp. A man bought a rubber stamp with the church name and address on it so they could use it. You know, those rubber stamps are good. Those are, those are fun, right? You, you do that, but then eventually they wear out. Well, the secretary never let him know that it ran out, and they went and they bought one, and somehow this person knew or found out that they weren't using his stamp anymore, and he caused havoc in that church and split it down the middle over a rubber stamp. And you think, this is what we're doing? Like, like what foundation are you on? If you're that easily moved, what foundation really are you on? Because Jesus don't move like that. The Holy Spirit moves, but he moves you. He doesn't move. The, he doesn't move what you're on. He moves you. Because you know what? If you imagine this, if you imagine something like this, uh, you know I like object lessons. If you imagine something, a, a, a foundation like this. And in our walk with God, now we're this is our foundation, this is Jesus Christ. No, no man can lay a better foundation than that is Jesus Christ. But we move all around on this foundation. Now, when we get close to the edge, now you don't ever have to worry about Jesus breaking. You don't ever have to worry about Jesus, you know, it fails and you fall off. You don't ever have to worry about that. But the Holy Spirit's job is to keep you in the most center part of the security of that foundation. So the Holy Spirit moves us. It doesn't move the foundation. Because when you move the foundation, everything else comes a tumbling down. So it's kind of like a little, little, uh, a little thing that we can think of uh, to kind of help us understand what the Holy Spirit does for us. It's not that we're going to fall off the rock. It's not like a, you know, if you've ever taken your kids somewhere and, and there's, there's a, you can take them fishing and then there's this drop off on rocks there and you're trying to keep them away from the edge because the dirt can give out or they could, they could get nervous and they could fall in. None of that is, is even what we're discussing. We're on a solid rock. The Lord is my rock. He is my personal rock. I am in and on him. And I'm right there, but the Holy Spirit's job is to move me through the word to keep me center. <laughs> Although we're on the rock and the Lord is our rock, we are not always in our center, are we? We're not always there. Otherwise, why would the Holy Spirit have to move us at all? Why would he have to move us if we're already where we should be? The point is, is we're not where we should be. And that's why the Holy Spirit has to move us. Now, the Lord is the rock of institutions. The Lord is the rock of Israel. And he still is. Second Samuel 23.3, the God of Israel said, The rock of Israel spake to me, He that ruleth over men must be just ruling in the fear of of God. Man, I wish we had people running our country with that philosophy. Man, what a difference would that make? Big difference. The Lord is also the rock of the church. Remember, he said, thou art Peter, and upon this rock, speaking of himself, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He is the rock of the church. And you'll find that in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. 
The, the Lord is also the rock of the home. He has to be our rock at home. He can't just be your rock one place and not your rock anywhere else. If you're on the foundation and you're not, and he's not moving and you're not moving, then you're going to be where he's at. So he needs to be the foundation of the church. He needs to be the foundation of our home. He needs to be the foundation of everything in our lives so that where he is, we can be on something firm. We will never hit quicksand when you're on the rock of the Lord Jesus Christ. Never hit it. Not ever. Now, in Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 and 25, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. We are promised that. That is such good design. You don't build your house on the sand because you will lose your house. That is nothing stable. You can't you try building a, a sand castle too close to the shoreline. It's gone instantly. And you're like, what did you expect? We can't build like that. The Lord is also, fourthly, the rock of the individual. David said, the Lord is my rock. Psalm 40, verse 2 says, He brought me up also out of an horrible pit, out of a miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. See, God wants us... And this is his plan for each of us, is that we would, first of all, have a sure footing. He will make, uh, you know, there's a part of the scriptures that says that I will make thy feet like hinds feet. In other words, you know, like the, like the goats that can climb all these little impossible, you know, goats are hilarious. They're creepy as all get out, but they're, they're funny too. But they're very agile, and they can get up on the smallest of rock and climb up the side of the face of, a, of this giant, giant hill or mountain-esque type thing. And, uh, you know, just as long as nothing loud happens, and they go, <laughs> you ever seen those videos with those, those goats are weird, man. You shock a goat, and it just, all fours go out straight, and it just falls over like it's dead. Creepiest thing ever. It's weird, and then that that whole uh, pupil going the wrong way. I, oh, that always oh man! Every petting zoo, I just I I just don't even go anywhere near the uh, the, the the goats because they're just terrible. They're just weird to look at, and they they make me just feel ooh. I just don't like them. Don't like goats at all, and I I don't think God likes goats either. And I think I got scripture to back that up. I do know he likes sheep. Listen, he's going to set our feet on a solid rock and then establish your going. He's not going to establish your going until your feet are on something firm that you're not going to slip off of. That's what God does. His plan is that we have sure footing. And then we have a more sure word of prophecy. He's, he's done a lot to make sure everything. The foundation of God standeth sure. Okay, it's, it's not going anywhere. It's a surety. The Lord Jesus Christ is our rock. He's the, the, the Lord is the rock of our salvation. In 2 Samuel 22, 47, the Lord liveth, and blessed be my rock, and exalted be the God of the rock of my salvation. And our salvation is rock solid. It's rock solid. Next, the Lord is the rock of our truth. 
Now, we have to have that. We have to have a firm footing on the truth. Deuteronomy 32.4, he is the rock. His work is perfect for all his ways are judgment. A God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he. So he's the rock of our truth. The Lord is the rock of our security. Psalm 40, verse 2, he brought me up also out of an horrible pit in a miry clay, set my feet upon a rock, and established my goings. The Lord is the rock of our protection, and that's found in Exodus 33, 21 and 22. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock. And it shall come to pass, while my glory passeth by, that I will put thee in the cliff of the rock, and will cover thee with my hand while I pass by. He wanted Moses to be standing somewhere sure. And then he hid him. Oh, I, I, I just, I can never get enough of that. I can never get enough of that. What an amazing moment. That God would not only... Put him on a rock. Just, can you mean being manhandled by God, just picked up? Can you imagine that? He did that for us spiritually, but think about this. He did that to Moses physically. He picked him up. He put him on a rock. Then he hid him in the cleft of the rock while he passed by. Then he put his hand down and let Moses see the backside of God the Father himself. Nobody else has seen in the flesh. Nobody has even come close to seeing that. But Moses did. He got handled. God handled that. He protected him because the glory, I would say that the glory of God was so strong. If Moses would have even just seen the full glory of God, it would have killed him. Why, why does God got to protect us from him? Why would he have to protect Moses from just seeing him? Because he's so holy, he's so righteous, that no man could look on the face of God and live, which is why he still wasn't allowed to see the front part. Only the back part. But the glory and the holiness of God was so intense that it would have killed Moses on the spot. So God puts him in the cliff of the rock, covers it with his hand, walks by, drops the hand, and there he is. Not only, I'm sure he had a, an, an amazing view already of everything around him, but his eyes beheld something that we are not told any other eyes have beheld on the face of the earth. We're, we don't find that in the scripture anywhere where anybody else was even offered a chance to see any part of the living God. But Moses, wow, that is just incredible. It is incredible to think about that, but that's protection. Sometimes in those instances, God had to protect Moses just from how holy he is. That's something. That ought to tell us something. The Lord is the rock of our defense. Psalm 62, 6, he only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. Oh, I like that. The Lord is the rock of our strength. He's the rock of our strength. Isaiah chapter 17 and verse 10. Because thou hast, uh, because thou hast forgotten the God of thy salvation and hast not been mindful of the rock of thy strength, therefore shalt thou plant pleasant plants and, uh, and shall set it with strange slips. Wow. We ought to be we ought to be mindful of the rock of our strength. Because you know what I think we forget? 
I think we kind of forget that, don't we? I mean, the, the minute I said, the Lord is our rock, everybody, yep, yep, that's right, amen, and good, and good for it. But what about in the middle of the week or the back half of the week when those burdens are pressing down on you, when those things are happening to you? Do you say the Lord is my rock then? Even though you might know it, you don't, you don't really, you're not mindful that he is. What we need to do is be mindful that he is our rock. That will help keep us out of a lot of issue. That will help keep us a little bit better. Uh, and we check ourselves. Sometimes we need to just check ourselves and say, listen, the Lord is my rock. He's my salvation. He's my strength. He's my provider. He's my protector. He's my everything. And it hasn't happened. He knew it would happen before it happened. He knew the burden would be here before I knew anything about it. And he's got a plan. And he is, he's the rock I depend on. And I become mindful of the, the presence of God. Being mindful that he is will help us in, in all these things. He is the rock of our defense. He is our refuge. He is our strength. The Lord is the rock of our strength. Isaiah 17, 10, Because thou hast forgotten the God of thy salvation has not been mindful. Man, that's so bad. You forgot the God of your salvation. You haven't been mindful. We need to be mindful. Next, the Lord is the rock of our supply. Our supply comes from him. Exodus 17, 6, Behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. God said, you go forth to the rock at Horeb, and I'm going to be there. He said, I will stand before thee on the rock. I'm, I'm like, wow, this is a wow moment. This is another wow moment because God said he would be standing on the rock that Moses was supposed to smite. I will stand before thee on the rock that is in Horeb, and you're going to smite it, and out's going to come water that everyone can drink from. Because God was on the rock. He was the rock. The rock is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's one of the reasons that Moses got in trouble later on. Because he went back to the early command when God told him the second time, speak to the rock. He didn't tell him to hit it the second time. Moses got mad. And he smote the rock. Now, water still came out, but it killed his life. It took his life. That one decision cost Moses being able to be inside the promised land. It didn't cancel his ability to see it. Because when God had that meeting, you know, the meeting with the boss, God had him up there and he said, I want you to look at this. Look at the land which I have promised. Look at it. But because of what you've done, you will not be entering in. He still showed it to him. Now, I don't have any scripture to back this up, but I, I don't find any place in that thing where other than God talking with him and he died. So this is what I think happened. 
and this is my own opinion. Like I said, I don't have a scripture to back it up. But we know what the Bible says, that no flesh can see God and live. I think when God got to the last part of that sentence, he stuck his face down into Moses' face to tell him, you will not be entering in. God. And then we find the next major thing concerning Moses, and that is God performing a funeral that nobody was able to attend. God buried him. God buried him. Because you know what would happen if they would have found the bones of Moses? They would have worshipped those bones because of Moses' reputation and being a leader of Israel, because even though it was God, and you, you notice how many times that the Lord said, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Egypt. He kept saying that over and over. It wasn't just a reminder. It was more than just a reminder, because mankind looks to mankind, and they give credit to mankind. Mankind would say, Moses God used Moses to bring us out. They would have given Moses the credit that God deserved because Moses couldn't do anything, even being from the house of Pharaoh, even being buddies with Pharaoh, practically brothers, raised up with him in the same home. No sway would have been given to let the Israelites go. Even we find a contending there that they were contending for the bones of Moses. That's one thing the devil wants really bad is the bones of Moses. Because if he could find that, he could cause a whole nation and possibly more than that to worship the bones of Moses instead of the God of Moses. That's big. That's big. Listen, we 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 tend to make things and 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 I I'm going to say this and I don't want to I don't want it to come off wrong. I don't want it to be received wrong. So just just know that I, I it's not coming from a place uh, 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 of anything other than our general knowledge. But we tend to treat things more special, things more special, and things get more attention than God. And even the cross is one of them. The cross is one of them. A cross was a tool that was used by God. It was a tree that was used by God. And there are people out there that are making it all about the cross instead of the Christ of the cross. The only reason, because remember, all the all the regular common man, he had two common thieves that died on a cross right by him. It was a common way for somebody to be put to death. But what made it special, what made it significant, is that God's only begotten son was hanged on that cross for our sins, but it still remains a wonderful tool, and we love it, and we can cherish it, and we can hold on to that, but I want to say that we should not make anything more important than the God. You can't make it more important than God. It's not that important. It is a regular tool used by God, just like you and I are tools used by God to do something on this earth, to see someone miss a, a lake of fire forever. God does that. 
So the, the key is it to put all the things and uh, and, and all of our things and, and our hopes and our dreams and our worship and all that into anything other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Not the cross, not the tomb. We could make go and make a huge big deal out of the tomb. What makes the tomb so special? It's the fact that Jesus isn't in it. That's what makes it special. It was a temporary place where he was laid to fulfill prophecy concerning him. And his body laid there. But he is the one who rose from the dead. He is the one who went down to the heart of the earth and preached to the saints and, and led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men and showed them infall with infallibility that he is God. That's what it's all about. It's not in our traditions. It's not in our things. It's not in the, the tools that were even used. Because the tomb was just like the cross. It was a conductor of the power of God. The cross was a conductor of the power of an atoning sick blood amplified to meet an entire world's sin at one point, at one time, all the time. And the tomb was the conductive power of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ because he's alive. I just don't know if you remember that, but he's alive. He's alive. He lives. I serve a risen Savior, not one that's still in the tomb. He came out of there. He folded his own laundry. That's all they found was a, his laundry that he folded. Mom always said, make your bed. Hey, it was a conductive power of salvation. We needed both conductors to have any shot at salvation. Because we couldn't have had the power of salvation without the power of the atonement. And the power of atonement would mean nothing if the grave hadn't been overcome. Both of those conductors were used to amplify God's eternal all power for our benefit. Ooh, what? All that power was so that you and I could miss the lake of fire and be where he is. The ultimate display of the power of God, even above creation itself, happened within those three days and three nights in one location. Amplified. God's power was maximized. And there... Everything was made right between man and God because of that. And those are special. I, like I said, I don't want to take anything away. I would never want to take anything away from that tomb because without it, we wouldn't have songs about the empty tomb. I would never take anything away from the precious cross of Calvary. Because without that, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. There's no forgiveness. There's no atonement. There's no mercy that can be shown because there was no perfect blood except his. But it was a tool, a specific tool that was used to amplify God's power to take care of all people for all time. 
at one time, at one location, the shockwave. Uh, imagine, uh, and you've, you've, you've all probably seen footage of like a nuclear bomb that they've showed on TV where, 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 where you see the bomb drop or even a lot of the regular bombs. You see what happens when it hits after you see the mushroom cloud. Then what happens? You see the big shock wave that ripples in 360 degrees all the way around in every direction for up, upwards of, I think they said, even 100 to 120 miles, the shock wave. And it's a devastating shock wave that obliterates everything in its path for that, long, uh, for that long of a distance. Now, if you take that and you amplify that, you will find that the blood of Christ and the amplification of the blood of Christ and the amplification of the resurrection of Christ was like 800 billion nuclear bombs going off at the same time at one location, at one circumference, and it blasted a radius and destroying sin throughout all the ages. That's something to say. That is how powerful God is. And that's what he did with those two wonderful tools. It was supercharged. Supercharged. God already had all power, but he decided to display it. That's what we can see. Several thousand years later, we can look back and still see the shockwave going and watching people as they get saved and their sins eradicated instantly under the blood of Christ. The shockwave still goes until Jesus Christ comes again. When he comes again and collects us, that will be another monumental display of supercharged power that will then cancel out the ripple effect because no more people will be able to be saved by the blood of Christ after that. It's an everlasting gospel in Revelation. It's no longer believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. It's different. We have something special that we could get in on before Jesus comes, and that's to be part of the bride of Christ. The church is the bride. He's the rock of our supply. And just in conclusion, just going to throw out uh, a, couple, a couple last things here. He is our one and only rock. 1 Samuel 2.2, 2, there is none holy as the Lord, for there is none beside thee, neither is there any rock like our God. Next, he is our cornerstone. 1 Peter 2.6, wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, behold, I lay in Zion, chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Lastly, to the unsaved, he is the rock of offense. Because like I said, the truth is always offensive to those that are not lined up with it. Isaiah 8, 14, and he shall be for a sanctuary, but for a stone of stumbling and for a rock of offense, both to the houses of Israel, for a gin and for a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Man. That was Isaiah 8, 14. The Lord is my rock. We need to be mindful of that. Honestly, we need to be mindful of that. That will absolutely help us if we could just but be mindful of what the Lord is and who he is and what he brings to our lives. My goodness, the, the amount of things that could just be washed away by just remembering Psalm 18 in the first two verses. And I would encourage you, if you're having a tough time, if you're having a rough week, if you're having a rough day, pull up Psalm 18. 
And you don't have to stop reading after verse 2, but I guarantee you'll start feeling better after verse 2. Remind yourself, be mindful that the Lord is my rock. You get to say that. You get to say that. Not everybody can say the Lord is their rock because they haven't met him yet. They haven't been on the solid rock of which we stand. And all other ground is sinking sand. They haven't, they haven't been there. We're there. And our job is just to kind of help people up on the rock. Uh, I'm not the foundation, but come join me on my foundation. He's awesome. Let's come for the invitation.